All righty. So today's message is I am the greatest. Now I'm hopefully not talking about me because I am not the greatest. <laughs> and if you notice, I capitalize I am. Okay, that's special to this ser sermon. So that's going to unfold as we go on. Now that term or that, that statement, I am the greatest, we've heard that before in American culture. We've heard that before. A long time ago, there was a guy who used to proclaim this, and we got a short video of him saying this statement. I am the greatest. Okay. Now, if you were around in the 70s and maybe the early 80s, you definitely know who that is. That's Muhammad Ali. Okay. Uh, he sadly passed away, I think, in 2016, but he could hold the claim to being the greatest boxer of all time. He really was an amazing boxer, but he was a braggadocious individual, to say the least, and he was really uh, great at self-promotion and using his uh, trash-talking, I guess you could call it, to really intimidate his opponents. And, uh, but he, he claimed he was the greatest, and for a time, he was the greatest heavyweight boxer in the world. And um, uh, we have a local connection to Muhammad Ali, and a lot of people might not realize that, especially some of the younger folks. Uh, we have his training camp not too far from here in Deer Lake. Uh, Muhammad Ali set up a training camp in Schuylkill County in, like, I think, 1972. And he uh, built that because it was secluded, it was in the middle of nowhere, and he could just go and focus and train in, up there for his big fights, like the Thrilla in Manila, everybody remember that one, or the Rumble in the Jungle. And uh, when he was doing this, this training, uh, he, you know, he, he, he uh, worked with a lot of different people, and a lot of people interacted with him, and he didn't just stay at the training camp, he would venture out into the local area. And um, this all happened like around the early 70s. I was a little kid back then, and I remember there was a kid in my grade, in fourth grade, who said, I met Muhammad Ali. And we were like, you're full of it. <laughs> nobody believed, nobody believe, what are you talking about? No, I met him, I met Muhammad Ali. And we were like, what are you talking, we didn't really know that he had this training camp back then. And, uh, he goes, no, I met him. My, my, aunt, my aunt introduced me to him at this grocery store on Route 61. And I was like, what? No, like, nobody believed this kid. And uh, so one day, the kid brings in a little photograph of him, his aunt, and Muhammad Ali in the grocery store. Okay? <laughs> so we're like, okay, you did meet Muhammad Ali. And it was because he was out, you know, getting his can of cheese whiz or whatever. I don't know what he was buying up there at the grocery store, but he was outside and he, and he actually met my, my buddy in fourth grade. And uh, now that's a, a neat life experience. Wow, you can say I met Muhammad Ali, I got a picture of him. That's really cool. So he had, my buddy had a brush with greatness, right? He got to be around Muhammad Ali for you know, a minute or two and, and, and got a picture with him. But that's just kind of a cool story. That didn't really impact this guy's life that much. But there are people that were around the greatness of Muhammad Ali that were majorly affected by him. And uh, this is a, another picture from 1974. Uh, that's when uh, my buddy met Muhammad Ali. Can you see the guy there on, uh, I guess it would be the left, in the white shirt? Can you read that? What it's a, that's Larry Holmes, okay? It's a young Larry Holmes, the Easton assassin, okay? Larry Holmes was a young guy at that time, an up-and-coming boxer, and he got a job as Muhammad Ali's sparring partner so he could train to fight, you know, Joe Frazier and George Foreman and those kind of guys. Larry Holmes was the sparring partner who helped train Muhammad Ali or helped be the, you know, dummy that got hit by Muhammad Ali. <laughs> so he had a totally different experience in the presence of greatness than my little buddy did in fourth grade, okay? And we're going to get back to Larry and that whole story a little bit later on. But I'm not here to talk to you about the greatness of Muhammad Ali, okay? I'm here to talk to you about the truly greatest, and that is the great I am. That is God himself. And 
we're going to be talking about why God is the greatest and how that can impact your life and how that can affect your life. So God is truly the greatest. And you remember in the story of Moses and the burning bush when, Mo- when Moses encountered God, Moses said, well, who should I say is talking to me? And God said, I am. That's God's name, I am. He exists beyond time, and, and that was his name there for Mo, that he told Moses. So God is the greatest. And so let's, let's look at some ways that we can see the greatness of God. Hold on a second. Got to wet the whistle. Okay. God demonstrates his greatness in all sorts of different ways. The first way that I'm going to talk about is the greatness of his amazing universe, okay? The stars, we just sang this song, right? He, he knows the stars, he calls them each by name, right? And he holds the stars and he, know, he calls them by name. God created the universe. Now, I'm gonna give you some amazing facts about that, but just check it out in Psalm 8, it says this. When I, and this is by David, when I consider Your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. This is David, the the shepherd boy out amongst the stars, looking at the stars and being like, wow, God, you created all of this and you created me too? What you, you, You can think to create the stars, but you're mindful of me? Little David, a little shepherd boy? That's amazing to think that the God who created those stars is also mindful of us. So here's some amazing facts about space. Okay, the sun, that's in the middle of our solar system, and that's what's making it like 94 degrees out there today. But the sun is 864,000 miles in diameter. That's hard to wrap your mind around, that's huge. If the sun was a hollow sphere, you could fit 1.3 million Earths inside of the sun. Like, that's mind-bogglingly huge. Okay, Uh, just to let you know, I don't know if these are, you got these, but these are in the, these are fact sheets of a lot of things I'm going to be talking about in the bulletin today. You could take those home and refer to them. So the sun is huge, but there's lots bigger stars than the, the sun. There's a star called Canis Majoris, which means the greater, go- the greater dog, the, the big dog. The big dog star is 1.7 billion miles in diameter. That's 2,000 times bigger than the sun. If it was set in our solar system, it would stretch from the sun to past the orbit of Saturn. That's one star. That is monumentally huge. Okay, and it just get, keeps getting bigger and bigger. We are, our, our sun is part of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, sometimes when it's really clear out, you can see like a, a milky streak across the sky. That's, that's one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. In the Milky Way galaxy, there are 100 billion stars, 100 billion suns in the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy is just one of 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Isn't that crazy to think of? And the universe is expanding at something like 45 miles a second, which would be like going from here to Atlantic City in about just over two seconds. That's how fast the universe is expanding. That's 186 or 163,000 miles an hour the universe is expanding. Now, you know, scientists will tell you that it's, this all happened from the Big Bang and, you know, they're, they don't, they're very caged on what that is. But they're basically saying, like, in the, beginning, in the beginning of time was nothing. And then nothing exploded and created everything. That's pretty bizarre. That's pretty ridiculous. We believe that God spoke the the universe into being. Okay? The Big Bang is an explosion. When's the last time you saw an explosion create anything good? Explosions destroy things, right? 
Explosions wreck things, except they can make holes in the ground or whatever. Okay, so we're supposed to believe that nothing exploded and created everything. No, the, the greatness of God created this universe, this amazingly great universe. Okay, how else can we see the greatness of God displayed? We can see it in the amazingness of the life that he created. Okay, let's go into Genesis chapter 1. We're all familiar with the creation story, but I got three verses that I strung together here in Gen, uh, Genesis 1. I got 11, 20, and 24. Verse 11 says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees of, on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. God spoke plants into existence. Boom. Then in verse 20, And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. God said, I'm going to create sea creatures and, and air, uh, birds. Then he goes on, And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God spoke, and the animals were created. Now, again, we're, we're told in science class that uh, back millions and billions of years ago, there was this, like, soup on the earth, and this soup was, like, primordial soup bubbling around, and boom, like, life popped out of it. That's what we're taught as fact, okay? But the fossil record does not go along with that, okay? It doesn't go along with evolution or any of that kind of stuff. We're supposed to believe that we all descended from some single cell animal and then it all just happened. It's, it doesn't show up that way in the fossil record. As a matter of fact, you know, you hear, you hear about the missing link? Okay, well, they keep finding missing links. They keep getting disproven all the time. But we're told that, hum, uh, that humans descended from some kind of mammalian shrew type creature millions of years ago. Like we're all descended to this shrew type mouse thing. Okay? But there are, there's 5,000 different, there's 5,513 different mammalian species. Okay? All different kinds. So a mouse is a mammal and a blue whale is a mammal and a baboon is a mammal, and a cow is a mammal. And we're supposed to believe that they all descended from this weird shrew-type creature, but they never find the transitional species ever in the fossil record. The animals show up in the fossil record fully formed. Every single one of the species is fully formed in the fossil record. They're, they've never found these missing links. They don't exist because God spoke it into being, and then the animals were there. That's amazing. God created it. It wasn't just time and chance. God created this. That's the greatness of God, that he can speak life into existence, right? That's amazing to think of. Uh, in, in terms of species, scientists have cataloged between 1.4 and 1.7 million different species on Earth. That's like plants and animals and single-cell things, algae, stuff like that. But they know that there, or they believe that there's way more species than, that they, than they, they've even discovered. There could, be, there could be between as many as 8.7 to 30 million species of life on Earth, most of which have not yet been discovered or cataloged. So we're told that life is easy and it just popped out of this primordial soup, and yet it's why don't, why don't we see species popping up all the time? It doesn't make sense. Because God spoke it into existence in the past, okay? It's not, it doesn't work like that, all right? So, God just shows his greatness through the, the stars. That's looking at the life. I'm looking at the world through telescopes. And he can show us his greatness by when we look in the world through microscopes, too. Okay, and he can show us his greatness through his greatest creation, which is mankind. We are called his masterpiece. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. God's word says that humanity is God's masterpiece. So 
when we look at humanity and actually all living creatures have something called DNA inside them, okay? And DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. That's a tongue twister to even say that at like, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> So DNA is an amazing molecule. It's an organic molecule that sh has information in it that allows cells to replicate and reproduce. And DNA is what creates us and makes us be, be here from the cell of the mom and the cell of the dad coming together, forming your DNA, and then moving forward and creating the person that you are here today. There's, it's a four character coded language that tells cells how to function and reproduce, okay? Bill Gates, love him or hate him, uh, one of the smartest guys in the world in computers. He said that the, the, if DNA was a computer language, it would be far more advanced than any computer language we've ever developed. Far, far more advanced than any language we've ever developed. Check this out. The human body has about three, about 30 trillion to 100 trillion cells in it. Each one of those cells has a six foot strand of DNA inside of it. Okay, we, every cell must have DNA in it or it won't reproduce, it won't fix itself. And so if you took all 30 trillion strands of DNA and stretched it out, it would be 34 billion miles long. And it would extend from Earth to Sun, the Sun, and back again 183 times. 183 round trips from here to the Sun is this, just the length of the DNA that's inside our bodies. That's pretty amazing. But like I said, Bill, Bill Gates said it's an amazing language. It has information in it, it carries language, it carries a code that, that tells our cells how to function and, and move on. And just one strand of DNA has the data equivalent of 5,000 books in it. Just one six foot strand of microscopic DNA has the information of 5,000 books in it. If you had a gram of DNA, one gram, Okay, a gram is about the weight of a raisin or a paper clip. That's, that's, a, that's a gram, okay? A gram would hold 270 trillion DNA strands or molecules, and it would have the entire storage power of everything currently on the internet, well, on the internet in 2017. All the data on the internet could fit in one gram of DNA. Now, um, Y'all have, a lot of people have, I don't know if you can see it, you know, that's a flash drive. The, those are used to transfer like photos and files and stuff from computers. And I, don't, I didn't weigh this, but this probably weighs about maybe like 20 raisins or something like that. So let's say this weighs like 20 grams or maybe 10 grams. The, it would take something like 12 to 16 million of these to equal one gram of DNA. Isn't that crazy? And we're supposed to believe that that just popped out of the soup? <laughs> like, that's, that's ridiculous. God created it and he shows his amazingness in humanity and, and how he created animals and trees and shrews and skunks and you know, cows and everything. God made it and that shows his greatness. God's greatness is shown in so many other ways too. How about the miracles of God? We talked about Moses, the burning bush. Okay, think of the, the miracle of the plagues that he called down on Pharaoh. The miracle of the Red Sea parting. The miracle of the Jordan River parting. The miracle of the wall, walls of Jericho crumbling. The miracle of uh, David defeating Goliath. The miracle of um, Gideon defeating the Midianites with 300 guys and some broken pots, you know, and, and some, I mean, come on, these are miracles of God, right? The miracle of Daniel in the lion's den, the miracle of his three buddies in the fiery furnace, I could go on and on, the miracle of Esther, you know, what she did. There's so many miracles of God, that's just some of the Old Testament miracles. Uh, there's, um, 
one of the hugest miracles is how he preserved his people. You know what God's people, his nation is called in the Bible? Anybody know? Israel, okay? That's God's people. And uh, do you remember when Jacob wrestled with God? You remember that? By the Jabbok River, I think it was. And uh, after that wrestle, uh, God popped out his, his hip socket and all that kind of stuff. And then he said, your new name's going to be Israel. Okay, so that's the beginning of Israel, right? That was like 3,700 to 4,000 years ago that this little family was called God's people and said, you're going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand and the, the beaches and all that stuff. So God created his family, his people, back then. He preserved them through the Egypt, Egyptian captivity and slavery, brought them into the promised land. He preserved them from the Babylonian captivity, brought them back into his promised land. These are huge miracles, huge miracles. And something amazing happened with God's people all the way up into the 20th century. What happened in 1948, Carl? Israel was formed, exactly. The nation of Israel was formed in 1948. This group of people that was this, this extended family back in, you know, 2000 B.C., was preserved all the way to become a nation in Israel in 1948. And God pres preserved them three times through at least three major wars in the 20th century, 1956, 1967, and 1973, when all the Arab nations attacked Israel and they could never overcome Israel. God, God's miracle just of how he preserved the people of Israel shows his amazing greatness, right? Now, God's greatness is also shown in the changed lives of people that he encounters, okay? Moses got to see God multiple times. Moses was an angry dude that, that uh, murdered one of the Egyptian guys, and then he, he, he kind of slunked out of Egypt, and then he encountered God at the burning bush, and he started to argue with God, like, God's like, I want you to lead my people, and Moses is like, yeah, you got the wrong guy, I, I can't really speak, you know? He starts doing all these, you know, hemming and hawing around, and God's like, no, you're going to be my guy. And Moses became one of the greatest leaders and prophets of all time because of that encounter with greatness, you know? Think about that. Think about the other people that God encountered. Think about all the people that Jesus encountered and how their lives were amazingly transformed when they came into the presence of his greatness. Legion, the, the Gerasene demoniac, he had a whole legion of demons in him. Jesus wiped them out, sent them out, and preserved him and restored him. Mary Magdalene was also possessed by numerous demons. And when she came into Jesus' presence, the presence of his greatness, she was totally transformed. You know, Jesus transforms lives to this very day through his greatness. And so God shows his greatness by the by the changed lives of people that he encounters, and he changes. I mean, I'm one of them, okay? I used to be a long-haired, you know, hippie freak. But, and he completely <laughs> changed me around, and there's people that probably in the room that knew me back then that can attest to that. So God changes people through his greatness. But the greatest way God shows his greatness is through the work and the person of Jesus Christ. We talked about his miracles, his teach his teachings, his wisdom. Um, but the fact that Jesus came to this earth, lived a sinless life, willingly died on the cross for our sins, and rose again from the dead, dead, defeating sin and death, making the one way for us to heaven, that shows the greatness of God, the greatness of his love for us in such an amazing way, such a unique way. God is great, and he shows his greatness in so many amazing ways. But guess what? There is a problem. There's a problem. We are frail. We're frail human beings, and we have a tendency, I certainly do, maybe I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I think we in general have a tendency to miss the greatness of God and get focused on the, 
the, the horizontal, on the, the worldly, on the, the things right in front of us. You know, um, if you ever go down to Amish country, you'll see the, the horse and buggy going down the road, and the horses have those, what are those called? They have blinders on them, right? So they can't see off to the right or left. They've they got to see. So we have blinders on us a lot of time to the greatness of God because we're so focused on the temporal, on the worldly, on the, you know, somebody put a mean post out there on Facebook and like now that's all I can think about. Or, you know, somebody did something crazy in the world, that's all I can think about. Or my boss treated me poorly today and now all I can think about is that and I get wrapped up in all these worldly, worldly things. And so we get stuck on this like two-dimensional horizontal plane and we forget to look up to the greatness of God. We forget that vertical relationship. We forget that, that God is in control, that God does hold all the stars, that God does know them by name, that God created us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He has a plan and purpose for our lives, that he sent his son Jesus to die for us, that there's a, a heavenly home waiting for us. We can, we can get so wrapped up in the, the daily grind that, and, and miss God that it starts to become like sort of depressing and sort of short-sighted. And, and the more we get stuck on this horizontal, the worse, the worse it gets. And I mean, I'm, I'm a victim of it. I, I find that happens to me. My wife like, nails me all the time. I'll tell you a quick story, and it's, it's kind of sad. The other day, it was, it was a clear out, a really clear night. And it was, it's been so hot and humid, you know, that it's just a muggy sky. Well, a couple nights ago, the sky really cleared out. And it was really, really nice out. And, and I was out running around doing something. I, I can't remember what. I think, I don't know what it was. But I came back home late. And they were all outside. My family was all outside. And they were... Um, looking at the stars. And I was thinking, is there like some kind of like meteor shower or something like that? But I had to run, I ran into the house, and I had to do something, you know, had to text somebody or whatever, sit down on the couch, had to text somebody, and then started looking at the phone. And what was I looking at, Carl? I was looking at the news. <laughs> Carl and me are like news junkies, so I started looking at the news, and then you know, 20 minutes later, the family comes back in. They're like, oh, we saw shooting stars. We saw this. We saw that. They were, and they were like praising God of the greatness of what they saw. And I got stuck in this stupid thing that I had no control over and put me back on this dumb horizontal plane. And they were like communing with God, looking at some shooting stars. I missed it. I missed it that night. And I felt like an idiot. You know, I felt really, Wow. But I don't know if anybody can relate. Can you, know, can you relate to what I'm talking about? So we get stuck. And it's not that God is diminished in his greatness because we don't see it. What I think is happening is the devil's messing with you. The devil's messing with me. The devil doesn't want us to see and recognize the greatness of God. He wants us to be stuck in our little circumstance. And he wants us to forget about the greatness of God. He wants to forget that God is a God of miracles, that God is a God of creation, that God is a God of mercy and grace and forgiveness and love. And he wants us to forget that and get stuck. He wants us to get stuck on the horizontal. So today I'm, I'm just saying, hey, look, we got to remember God is on his throne. God is all-powerful. God is the greatest. And whatever it takes, you know, putting the phone down or going out and looking at the sky and looking at the stars. Or I, I recently went down to Longwood Gardens. Anybody like Longwood Gardens? And I went to the orchid room. The orchid room is off the charts. I mean, I don't really think about flowers. I'm not like a real flower kind of guy, but I went into this orchid room. And I was like, wow, like God, like they're like life paint, like paintings in three-dimensional life that God made, you know, it's just amazing. Like, I challenge you, go down to the orchid room at Longwood Gardens and then come back to me and say you don't believe in God. It's so amazing. It's so evident of all the creation that God, God made. He's showing you his love and his greatness. You've got to 
break the cycle of the things that are, are dragging us down and get back to God. You know, uh, you can even see God on the farm, okay? Every time a calf is born, that's a miracle, okay? You might get goo and stuff all over your fingers, but you get to see the miracle of life in a newborn animal, you know, or kitty, kitty cats get born. That's a miracle. That's God bringing his greatness into your presence, you know? So God wants to show you that and break you out of the, the horizontal, get back to the vertical, right? Now, another thing about the greatness of God is this. When we're in the presence of greatness, great things happen, okay? Back to 1974 with uh, Muhammad Ali and Larry Holmes. Okay, Larry was a no-name sparring partner of Muhammad Ali, but he, Larry got into the presence of the greatest boxer. And, you know, taking all those shots and the rope-a-dope and all that kind of stuff, do you think that that affected Larry Holmes? Absolutely. He learned a lot from Muhammad Ali, and in 1980, he got to face Muhammad Ali. And does anybody know who won that fight? Eric, you remember that one? Guess who won? Larry Holmes won. Larry Holmes beat his mentor decisively. That's when they like stopped the fight and like you know, Ali was like, Grr. I mean, he was messed up, you know? So being in the presence of the greatness of God, we too will do great things and have be able to do great things, far greater than this. Jesus said this in John 14, 12. He said, and this is Jesus' words, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. That is a hard verse to wrap your mind around, but Jesus said it. It's in his gospel, and it's true. Jesus said we're going to do the same works and greater works because of the Holy Spirit that's going to come and live in us. I was just at a Jesus rally on Friday in Ephrata, and I was, me and Jason got to be part of this praise band up there, and it was off the charts in this tent revival meeting up there. I'm going to say 30 kids got baptized the guy was praying healing over all these people, like dozens of people were healed. It was off the charts, the great things that, that I witnessed and that Jason and I got to see over at that thing. That was amazing. That was off the charts. God has a great plan for you, and he wants you to be part of the greatness of his greatness. He wants you to do great things in his name. And, and it's possible because we have the Holy Spirit in us. So I want you to be encouraged today. I want you to know God is great. He's on his throne. He's in control. No matter the circumstance, he's got you. He created the heavens. He created the earth. He created all life. He does miracles in the past. He's doing miracles today. And he's with us. And he's going to empower us to do great things that he called us to do from the beginning of time, from before time, as Ephesians 2.10 says. That's the message today. That's the message. It's a message of hope. And uh, hopefully the band's coming out here. We're going to sing a song pretty soon that is an oldie but a goodie. Uh, it's really an old one uh, in terms of Christian music. But it is, it is a song that we get to proclaim the greatness of God. And I want to just pray as they're getting set up here. Um, Father God... You are the greatest. You are the great I am. You created all things. You created the heavens, the earth, the planets, the solar systems, the galaxies. You created all life. It's not a mistake. It wasn't an accident. It was purposeful. And we can look on your creation and be encouraged that you are all-powerful, almighty. You created miracles and showed us miracles throughout history. And you sent the greatest miracle of all, Jesus, to be our Lord and Savior, to die for our sins on that cross. We thank you for the miracle of salvation through Christ. So, Lord, I pray today that each and every person in this room be encouraged by your greatness, be empowered by the greatness of your Holy Spirit. 
to be able to do great things that you called us to do. And we rebuke the lies of the enemy over the people here and the people that are listening on the internet. We, we rebuke the lies of the enemy that are t- distracting them from your greatness and getting them to focus on the worldly circumstances. Lord, show us your greatness, whether it's through looking at the stars or reading your word or communing with your spirit or being here in worship. Lord, show us your greatness and let us never forget how great you are, O God. And it's in your name that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.